When Pharaoh was first confronted with the demand made in the name of the God of Israel to let my people go, he responded, Who is the Lord that I should obey his voice to let Israel go? I do not know the Lord, and besides, I will not let Israel go. The ten plagues that followed were the ultimate answer to Pharaoh. They demonstrated God's complete control over the forces of nature, and by facilitating the children of Israel's exodus from Egypt, proved his direct intervention in history. But there was another aspect to these plagues. In the book of Numbers, we read that the Lord had struck down their firstborn and had wrought vengeance against their deities. This verse introduces us to the very interesting idea that not only did the plagues prove the absolute sovereignty of the God of Israel, but that they also demonstrated the complete futility and falseness of the Egyptian gods. Each plague was aimed at undermining a specific deity or deities venerated by the Egyptians, as we shall now see. It was probably the Greek historian Herodotus who best conveyed the importance of the Nile River to the Egyptian civilization when he famously wrote that Egypt is the gift of the Nile. By providing a constant flow of sustenance, the Nile was the lifeline of ancient Egypt, and without it, the Egyptian civilization wouldn't have developed. The prophet Jeremiah expressed the central role the annual inundation of the Nile played, equating it with the very essence of Egypt. Who is this that rises like the Nile, like the rivers whose waters surge? Egypt rises like the Nile, and like the rivers whose waters surge. The annual flooding of the Nile during the summer months irrigated the fields, depositing new layers of silt, forming fertile land in an otherwise arid desert. The ancient Egyptians believed that this life-giving cycle was brought about by a deity named Hapi. Hapi was venerated as Lord of the River Bringing Vegetation, and symbolized fertility and life. It is interesting to note that one popular scientific theory attempts to connect the Nile turning blood red with heavy monsoon rains that fell by the headwaters of the Nile in the, Eth in the Ethiopian highlands. This theory postulates that excessive downpours caused massive runoff, saturating the river with tropical red sediment rich in iron oxide. Iron is, of course, also what gives blood its red color. As a result of this ecological imbalance, instead of the annual flooding of the Nile providing its typical life-giving sustenance, it brought a lifeless, blood-red hue, demonstrating to the Egyptians the incompetence of their god, Hapi. The plague of blood affected the ecological balance of the Nile causing a massive die-off of various species, and at the same time, an explosion in the frog population, which emerged from the river to devastate Egypt. Ironically, the Egyptians attributed godlike powers to frogs and epitomized them as a symbol of fertility. These powers were embodied in the goddess Hecate, who was depicted as a frog or as a woman with a frog's head. The ancient Egyptians believed that Hecate breathed life into new beings who were created by her husband Knum, on his potter's wheel. And so it was that the frog-headed goddess, who was supposed to have symbolized fertility, life, and renewal, failed her believers when the frogs became a nuisance, a symbol of environmental imbalance and nature run amok. Identifying the exact species that caused the plague of lice is a difficult endeavor. Perhaps they were ticks of some sort. Some tick species are known to lay their eggs on topsoil, and hence would have originated from the dust of the earth. Some have postulated that the heaps of decomposing frogs would have provided the perfect breeding ground for small flying insects, such as drain flies or biting midges, 
who develop in sludgy, moist environments. But whatever these lice were, they were brought forth by Aaron's striking of the dust of the earth, a symbolic strike against the god Geb. To the Egyptians, Geb, sometimes depicted as a human with the head of a snake, was the god and personification of the earth. When Pharaoh's magicians tried to produce the same results and failed, they realized that it was not Geb who was in charge. They realized this was the finger of God, the God of Israel, that is. What did the fourth plague, known as the mixture of harmful creatures, consist of? Well, there is actually a mixture of opinions in the Torah's oral tradition regarding the nature of this fourth plague. These different opinions could be summarized into two broad categories. One school of thought interprets this mixture as various predators and other harmful creatures, such as lions, wolves, leopards, birds of prey, snakes, and scorpions. If this was indeed the case, this could have been interpreted by the ancient Egyptians as a joint attack by their various animal deities such as Horus and Nemti, falcon-headed gods, Anubis, a jackal-headed god, Babi and Toth, the baboon gods, Apep and Nebukau, serpent-shaped deities, Hedet, the scorpion goddess, Sobek, the crocodile-headed god, Tawaret, a bipedal hippopotamus with a feline body, etc. The second school of thought holds that this mixture consisted of winged insects, and while this is the lesser common opinion, it is nevertheless the interpretation given, among other sources, by the Septuagint, perhaps the oldest surviving Jewish commentary on the Torah. A plague consisting of winged insects would have likely been especially disturbing to the ancient Egyptians who revered one uh, winged insect in particular, namely the scarab or dung beetle, as one of their most important symbols. The scarab beetle lays its eggs in a dung ball from which the newly hatched beetles emerge fully formed. To the Egyptians, this symbolized the power of creation from nothingness. They believed that, like the newly formed beetles, the sun too was created every day from nothingness. The Egyptians witnessed the scarab beetle rolling the dung ball and pushing it across the ground on its way to its burrow. To them, this symbolized the very movement of the sun across the sky. This movement was believed to be performed by a scarab-faced deity known as Kefri, one of the manifestations of the sun god Ra. One of the various opinions given in the Midrash regarding this fourth plague is the somewhat ambiguous opinion of Rabbi Yoshia, who, utilizing a play on words based on the original Hebrew term for this plague, Arov, states that the nature of this plague was that God darkened the Egyptians' luminaries. If this plague indeed did consist of winged insects, it would have been seen by the Egyptians as the very darkening of the sun, a betrayal of their beetle-faced god, Kefri. The prophet Jeremiah described Egypt as a beautiful heifer, and indeed livestock and in particular cattle played an essential role in the ancient Egyptian economy, providing a sustenance of milk and meat, as well as manual labor for agriculture, transportation, and carrying of burdens. In Pharaoh's dream interpreted by Joseph, it was the seven robust-looking cows that symbolized the seven plentiful years, while the seven scrawny-looking cows symbolized the seven years of famine. The worship of bovine deities can be traced back to the very beginning of the Egyptian civilization. One of the most important Egyptian deities, the goddess Hathor, was depicted as a cow, as a human woman with cow ears, or as a woman wearing a headband of cow horns. She was a sky goddess associated with love, beauty, music, rebirth, and rejuvenation, and motherhood as well. Another important deity was the Apis bull, worshipped in the Memphis region of Lower Egypt. The Apis, perhaps the inspiration for the sin of the golden calf, was the most celebrated bull deity in ancient Egypt, representing eternity and the harmonious cosmic balance. This is why the plague of pestilence and death of livestock represented such a blow for the Egyptians. Not only did it devastate one of the main components of their economy, it symbolized the downfall of one of their primary group of deities.
it is brought down that the plague of boils was unique among the plagues. This tradition explains that when we examine the verses describing the various plagues, we notice that they can be divided into three categories depending on whose direct action brought about the plague. The plagues of blood, frogs, and lice were brought about by Aaron. The plagues of hail, locusts, and darkness was brought about by Moses. And the plagues of harmful creatures, death of livestock, and the death of the firstborn were brought about by God himself. The plague of boils, however, was brought about by the combined action of Aaron, Moses, and God. This teaches us that this plague was one of the severest of all. It directly affected the immediate well-being of every single Egyptian, causing severe bodily pain and discomfort. Paradoxically, ancient medical documents discovered in Egypt reveal that the Egyptians actually possessed rather comprehensive medical and pharmacological knowledge. These documents predate Hippocrates, the so-called father of medicine, by at least a thousand years. This fact further emphasizes the severity of this plague. The verses describe that the magicians could not stand before Moses because of the boils, for the boils were upon the magicians and upon all the Egyptians. The magicians, who were the possessors of medical knowledge as well, were surely dumbfounded when they couldn't even heal themselves. The Jewish tradition teaches that there were actually 24 different variants of boils, and that any remedy that eased one variant made the next variant worse. When no remedy seemed to work, the Egyptians likely invoked upon their two primary healing goddesses, Sekhmet, the lioness-headed goddess who was the patron of physicians and healers, and was believed to possess a cure for any ailment, and Isis, one of the most important goddesses of ancient Egypt, considered the most powerful magician in the universe and possessor of many powers, including the power to heal the sick. Needless to say, the Egyptians were again failed by their deities. In fact, one Jewish tradition suggests that the boils lasted for the rest of their lives. When we read the verses describing the hail that befell Egypt, we immediately realize that this was not what we commonly refer to as hail, but something very different. This was understood by the sages of Israel as well, who equated the plague of hail with the large stones that fell from the heavens upon the Amorites while fleeing from Joshua and his army. Indeed, both events can be best interpreted as a storm of meteorites colliding with earth. Meteorites are composed of rocky, metallic, or icy bodies that ignite into fireballs when entering Earth's atmosphere at great velocities. This, of course, explains the descriptions of fire that accompanied the hail. Some sufficiently large meteorites don't completely disintegrate and hit the surface of the Earth with tremendous impact. This would explain the extent of the damage described in the verses, which included the destruction of trees. Another phenomenon often accompanied by meteorites, is massive sonic booms that could explain the descriptions of thunder. These sounds seem to have bothered Pharaoh more than any other aspect of this plague, as he begged Moses and Aaron, Entreat the Lord, and let it be enough of God's thunder and hail. This plague, in which the heavens rained down destruction upon earth in a terrifying display, must have had a major impact on the Egyptians. Astronomy played a major role in the Egyptians' belief system, as indicated by their many pyramids, temples, and other monuments that were built oriented towards the heavens. They believed that their sky goddess Nut governed the heavens and stars. She was depicted as a star-covered woman arching over earth and acting as a buffer, shielding the earth from the forces of chaos. But when Nut failed to do her job, and Egypt was pounded by a fiery storm from above, while at the same time the Israelites in the land of Goshen were left unharmed, it showed the Egyptians that it wasn't Nut who was in charge, but the God of Israel, the true creator of heaven and earth. When Moses and Aaron stood before Pharaoh to inform him about the coming plague of locusts, should he not concede to freeing the Israelites? They warned him that the locust shall cover the face of the land. In the original Hebrew, however, it actually says, v'chisa et ein ha'aretz, literally meaning that the locust shall cover the eye of the land. 
The Targum Unkelos, an ancient authoritative Aramaic translation of the Torah, interprets the eye of the land as the eye of the sun. In other words, this warning implied that the swarms of locusts will be so vast that they will literally obscure the view of the sun in the sky. To the ancient Egyptians, the sun was the very source of life itself, and hence it was their sun god Ra who was the most significant and most worshipped deity. He was believed to be the creator of the universe and life within, and the governor of all aspects of reality, including the sky, the earth, and the underworld. This was a major warning to Pharaoh. It was an indicator that God was now done playing games. It signaled the beginning of a final move against Egypt's primary deity. After delivering the message, Moses and Aaron leave and don't even wait to hear Pharaoh's response. Pharaoh's servants, comprehending the gravity of the situation, beg him to concede. How long will this one be a stumbling block to us? Let the people go and they will worship their God. Don't you yet know that Egypt is lost? Upon hearing his servants plea, Pharaoh summons back Moses and Aaron and inquires as to which specific Israelites Moses is requesting to free. But when Moses makes it clear that it is all of the Israelites that are to be freed, Pharaoh pulls back, clinging to Ra, his primary deity, as he sarcastically declares, So may the Lord be with you, just as I will let you and your young children out. See that evil is before your faces. In other words, Pharaoh says that the validity of the God of Israel to him is about as valid as him letting the entire nation go. But there is more hiding in this verse. In Hebrew, Pharaoh's words, see that evil is before your faces, is pronounced, Ri'u ki ra'a neged penechem. Literally, see that ra'a is before your faces. Thus, the word for evil in Hebrew, ra'a, in a pun-like fashion, sounds very similar to the name of the sun god, Ra. So by declaring, see that Ra is before your faces, Pharaoh is expressing that his faith abides with his god, Ra, while refusing to acknowledge the God of Israel. And then it begins. Moses stretched forth his staff over the land of Egypt, and the Lord led an east wind in the land all that day and all the night. By the time it was morning, the east wind had borne the locusts. It's important to understand that this eastern wind that carried the locusts was a unique occurrence. You see, usually when locusts invade Egypt, they come from the area of modern-day Sudan, located to Egypt's south, and are thus carried by a southern wind. This fact likely mortified Pharaoh, who was looking towards the east, hoping for the salvation of Ra, and instead saw a dark cloud of locusts heading straight for Egypt. The swarms of locusts grew and grew, until finally obscuring the eye of the land, the eye of Ra, and the sun could be seen no more. Various scientific theories attempt to explain the penultimate plague known as darkness. Some propose that it was the result of a total solar eclipse, while others explain that a massive sandstorm was the cause. Another popular theory suggests that the volcanic eruption on the Greek island of Thera, one of the most powerful eruptions in recorded history, spewed a plume of volcanic ashes and smoke large enough to reach and engulf Egypt. But no matter the physical cause behind the plague of darkness, its source was divine and its primary purpose was spiritual. The description in Exodus states that there was thick darkness over the entire land of Egypt for three days and at the same time, for all the children of Israel, there was light in their dwellings. These three days of darkness are reminiscent of the first three days of creation prior to the creation of the heavenly luminaries on the fourth day during these first three days, there were no stars and there was no sun, but at the same time, there was light. The light created on the, on the first day of creation when God said, let there be light. The reason the Egyptians had no light is because the light they were relying on was an external physical source which they deified as their god Ra. In contrast, the Israelites were not affected by the darkness because the light guiding them was an internal spiritual light the light of the first day of creation. This was a powerful lesson to the Egyptians. They realized that the sun, and by extension their god Ra, was neither the source of life nor the ultimate source of light. They also realized that if their primary god Ra was nothing but an illusion, then their entire pantheon was likewise a fictitious man-made creation.
The nine preceding plagues demonstrated to the Egyptians the futility, falseness, and illusion of many of their primary deities and beliefs. But there was still one deity left standing. In the prophet Ezekiel's vision of a pending judgment against Egypt, Pharaoh is described as the great monster that lies in the midst of his rivers, that has said, My Nile is mine, and I had made myself. Although this prophecy was delivered long after the Exodus, it nevertheless brings to light an important aspect shared by all the Egyptian pharaohs. As the absolute ruler of Egypt, the pharaoh was seen as an entity deputized by the gods themselves to function as a mediator between the heavenly and earthly realms. This divine authority, in turn, gave him the status of a god incarnate. And so Pharaoh was believed to comprise two aspects. On the one hand, his external earthly manifestation as immortal, and on the other, his true divine essence that was passed down and embodied by every single Pharaoh. Thus Pharaoh, who often wore a symbol of a ureus, or serpent, upon his head, continued the legacy and sin of the primordial serpent, who tricked Eve by promising her that in the day you eat from it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God. So the last deity left standing was Pharaoh himself, and it was primarily against him and what he represented that the tenth plague was directed. This is evident in the verses describing the plague that notably mentioned Pharaoh before anyone else. The Lord said to Moses, I will bring upon one more plague upon Pharaoh and upon Egypt. And similarly, and every firstborn in the land of Egypt will die, from the firstborn of Pharaoh, who sits on his throne, to the firstborn of the slave woman, who is behind the millstones. Consequently, the final plague demonstrated that Pharaoh was no different than the slave woman, that he was nothing but a mortal, that it was just a man behind the curtain. The ten plagues were not some petty contest or a mere act of vengeance enacted upon Egypt. In their very essence, they represent the beginning of a purging and deep healing of all that is wrong in the world. They were aimed at shaking the very foundations of reality in order to bring to the surface all the hidden lies and deceptions, all the evils and impurities, so that finally, only good will remain, so that finally, we can all leave Egypt behind.